chilling tales for dark nights. Six Crows Written by Daniel Davis Narrated by Jeff Clement There were six crows in that telephone wire. Rick glanced at his wife, who still had her face pressed against the passenger side window. What? On that telephone wire back there, there were six crows. Rick struggled for something to say. A witty comment or resentful retort. Instead, he grunted and returned his attention to the road. After a few seconds, Marie looked at him. Did you hear me? You mean about the crows? Yeah. Yeah, I heard you. Don't you think that's odd? Rick tried to find something in her eyes. Some proof that she was baiting him. Some sign that she was trying to make him look like a fool in front of their daughter again. What he saw made him frown. Marie looked worried. What's wrong? There were six crows on that telephone wire. She repeated. Rick swallowed, turned back to the road, and watched as one telephone pole replaced another. He felt Marie stare, but not the way she used to look at him. In the beginning, it had been sexy. Now it was annoying. Carefully, he said, I don't get it. Didn't you ever hear the rhyme? Apparently not. My grandmother taught it to me when I was little, and she learned it when she was little, back in England. I don't remember it exactly, but it said something like different numbers of crows meant different things, like three crows would mean good luck or something. <laughs> Does six crows mean we win the lottery? In the back seat, Chelsea giggled. Rick glanced at her in the rearview mirror. Thanks, honey. Daddy loves to have an audience. Rick. Yes, dear? Six crows are unlucky. Very unlucky. Uh Uh-huh. Rick didn't have to fight back the laughter. After seven years, he simply knew better than to laugh. That was the fourth grouping of six crows that I've seen in the past hour. Good thing it wasn't the sixth group. Then we'd really be screwed. You don't think that's a little disturbing? Marie, what I think is that your powers of observation are astounding. You managed to count how many crows were grouped together on a telephone wire while passing them at 60 miles per hour. Not only that, but I didn't even see the damn things. Are you saying I imagined it? He couldn't help himself. No, I'm saying only you would care. Rick. She let her voice trail off. The one good thing about their marriage, they had learned when to pick their fights. Whenever Chelsea was around was not an appropriate time. Still, their daughter could sense when something was wrong. In the rearview mirror, Rick saw Chelsea facing out the window, her eyes squinted. He knew how awkward it was trying to distance herself from the tension in front of her. He remembered feeling that way as a kid. It had been hell. Returning his attention to the road, Rick wondered how much further they had to go before they got out of Nebraska. The Atlas was in the back seat, highways highlighted in orange and pink, indicating an intricate pattern across the country. Perhaps the scenic drive hadn't been the best choice. It was taking far too long, and the Rockies wouldn't be in sight for another day or two at least. The interstate wouldn't have offered as many interesting detours, just the typical tourist destinations, but it would have gotten them there quicker and more efficiently. Rick found the two-lane highways at least during the stretches through fields of wheat, corn, and hay, boring. He felt drowsy and out of it. In a couple hours, he had to turn the wheel over to Marie, who was, if nothing else, a competent navigator. 
at least the weather was in their favor. Two days earlier, they had found themselves driving through a severe thunderstorm. Chelsea had been in tears, worried about tornadoes. Rick had placed the idea in her head and spent most of that hour mentally berating himself for it. Marie had to pull over, give the wheel over to Rick, and climb into the back with their daughter. She hadn't chewed Rick out that time. They'd both known it had been his fault. Marie had always been an artist with guilt. She knew when to lay it on and when to let it creep up at its own pace. The day was pleasant. Perhaps that was because the car was air-conditioned. Rick had experienced some horrible summers on the East Coast, but nothing prepared him for the barrenness of the Midwest. There were no trees, hills, or skyscrapers to block the sun. The heat was not a byproduct of the sunlight. It was the sunlight, unfiltered and uncompromising. The grass could take it. The grass and wheat were light enough to catch what little breeze blew across the fields, to sway in its brief reprieve. But a man standing out there would feel nothing but the blistering heat. We're in the middle of God's asshole, Rick thought, laughing. Marie's grandmother had been good for more than counting crows. She'd been a delightful dinner table conversationalist, with enough witticisms to start her own quotations dictionary. What's so funny? Marie asked. Rick noted that there was no hostility in her voice, only mild curiosity. <laughs> Nothing, he said. He just got me thinking about Helen. Marie smiled. You hear that, Chelsea? Daddy's thinking of Grandma Miller. <laughs> Grandma Miller, Chelsea said in a low, throaty growl, an imitation of a voice roughened by too many cigarettes. That'd be her, Rick said. She of the varicose veins and halitosis. What's that? You'll find out in a few years, sweetheart. We'll also have to discuss hernias, hemorrhoids, and crow's feet. Instantly, Rick regretted what he said. He glanced carefully at Marie. Yes, the amusement was gone from her face, but her smile remained. Do you remember her chicken and dumplings? Rick asked, rushing the words out faster than he should have. Good lord, I could have lived off them. And her banana cookies. Chelsea said from the back seat. Yeah, those too. And a raspberry pie, Rick added, smiling. Marie winced. Ew. Hey, you liked it. I pretended to like it to make her happy, Marie said. I call BS, dear. You ate it with gusto. You stopped liking it when you tried out the recipe, Rick told her. She always said the main ingredient was love. Doesn't mean you should skimp on the salt. I just thought we should try eating a little healthier. Marie said. You didn't like the spare tire you were getting, remember? Sorry I don't make enough to afford a gym membership. Daddy, what's that? Rick glanced into the rearview mirror. Chelsea was pointing at the windshield. He looked forward. Rick slammed on the brakes at the sight of something shiny in the middle of the road. Shit! Rick jerked the steering wheel to the right. The Toyota refused to turn with him. The car left the road, hit the gravel, and then drove headfirst into the ditch that separated the highway from the fields. The car came to a halt, the back bumper a couple of feet higher than the front. Rick stared out the windshield at the tall grass just a few feet in front of him swaying back and forth. Damn it! He put the car in reverse. The wheels spun. Rick. He tried again. God damn it! Rick! He glanced at his wife. She placed a tentative hand on his shoulder. Honey, turn the car off. He stared at her for a moment, then did as she asked. He couldn't think of anything else to do. Marie unbuckled her seatbelt 
Chelsea, honey, are you all right? Mommy. Rick ripped his seatbelt out of the buckle and turned around. Chelsea appeared to be okay. She was frightened, more so than she had been a couple days ago during the storm, but otherwise unharmed. Comfort was Marie's department. His wife had always been good with that. What the fuck was that? Rick! Jesus, I'm sorry. Marie, who had climbed into the back seat with their daughter, glared at him over Chelsea's tangled blonde hair. I don't know what it was. Maybe you should have been watching the road? Chelsea's crying kicked up a notch. Rick focused his attention at the hayfield. A retort sat at the tip of his tongue, but she was right. He should have been watching the road. He wiped sweat from his face, and as he did, he noticed stubble grating against his palm. He took off his glasses and rubbed his temple. He racked his mind, trying to figure out what he could do. Rick turned the car on, and immediately cool, brisk relief filled the vehicle. He angled a vent directly on his face. He needed a second to cool off and collect his thoughts. After a few moments of silence, Rick calmed down, Chelsea's sobs subsided, and Marie's panting slowed, though he still felt her stare. The argument would be moved until later, reserved until they checked into the next motel. That suited him just fine. He looked in both side view mirrors, trying to see the object he'd run over. All he saw, though, was sky. I should check how bad it is, he said. See what we hit. Marie didn't say anything. By the way her jaw clenched, he could tell she'd wanted him out of the car. He couldn't blame her. Rick opened the door and stepped out, falling a few more inches than he expected. The heat didn't hit him as much as engulf him. As soon as he was outside the Toyota, the air conditioning became a distant memory. The sun, beating down on him with no clouds to absorb the blow, became everything. He shut the door behind him, purposely refusing to look into the back seat as he checked to make sure none of the tires had blown, then scrambled up the ditch and onto the highway. The object that had caused him to derail the trustworthy Toyota lay a few yards down the highway. Rick shambled over to it. He stared at the object, cocking his head to the side, trying to figure out what it was. Some piece of metal, maybe from a tire or muffler. Awful shiny muffler, he thought. It wasn't anything, just an anonymous piece of thin metal, a few inches long, with one sharp end. He picked it up, turned it over in his hands, and threw it into the field. Fuck it, he thought as he walked back to the car. Marie rolled the window down in the back. What did we hit? We didn't, thank God. Well, what was it? Rick shrugged. She rolled the window back up and turned back to their daughter. He stood at the back of the car, thinking about how hot it was and how tired he was from driving. He knew he would have to push the car on top of everything else. To that purpose, he hollered to Marie, Pop the trunk! She did, and he began taking out their suitcases and setting them safely aside. He didn't know if it would help at all, probably not, but it gave him something to do while he prepared himself for the labor ahead. Once the trunk was emptied, he slammed it shut and walked back to the driver's side. As he climbed into the car, the air conditioning caressed his skin. His sweat dried almost instantly, leaving him shivering. Rick relished every second of it, leaning back in the seat, eyes closed. Everything okay? Marie asked. He opened his eyes as if waking from a deep sleep. Part of him hoped to see the road, a gas station, or a hotel. Instead, all he saw out his windshield was hay. He turned around in his seat. Marie was no longer holding their daughter. Chelsea sat beside her, 
flipping through one of the books she'd brought. Her eyes scanned the page intently. Rick felt a moment of pride watching his daughter read, thinking perhaps she may even become an English teacher like him, although hopefully she'd wind up someplace more prestigious than Clarkview Middle. His eyes shifted from his daughter to Marie, who glared at him with furrowed brows. What are we going to do? I need to push this car out of the ditch. Can you do that? If you're sitting here with it in reverse, yeah, probably. Can't you just call a tow truck? I thought you said we don't have any reception out here. She sighed. The phone's there, beside you. Check. Rick picked up the phone. Hmm. No signal. There's gotta be a farmhouse around here. He coughed. (laughs) Wanna get out there and search for it? Probably miles down the road, either way. How about flagging someone down? How many cars do you remember us passing? I don't know. You can count crows, but not cars. I counted four. That's four in the past two hours. This isn't a highway so much as it is a skid mark. We're alone out here. She smiled at him. It's scenic though, isn't it? Maybe Chelsea can go up the road and see if she can wave down a busload of cheerleaders or something. Chelsea giggled. Okay, Daddy. Rick smiled. The three of them stepped outside the car. Marie gasped in the heat. Rick was surprised how much his body seemed to have forgotten it so quickly. We ain't in Kansas anymore. Though, it looks about the same. As Chelsea disappeared over the hill, Rick called out, Make sure you ask those cheerleaders if they have any beer with them. Okay. She called back down, laughing. Marie turned to him. Out there in the sun, she looked her age. Not that she was old. Neither of them were old. But she wasn't a young co-ed anymore, either. She didn't have a 20-year-old's body or grace. Certainly no college girl had those crow's feet. The sunlight seemed to highlight the creases in her face the imperfections in her skin. He figured it was doing the same to him, an equal opportunity humiliation. She pulled her hair back and let it fall limp against her shoulders. God, it's hot. You said it, Rick agreed. Marie looked up the road. She's okay up there, right? She's better than us, he nodded. We've got work to do. When I pound on the hood, throw it in reverse. Don't stomp on the pedal. Just let it down gradually. I want to see how this thing's going to react. Marie got in and closed the door. Rick heard the soft purr of the automatic window rolling down as he walked to the front of the car. He leaned against the hood, putting some force into it. The car rocked. The push would take a lot of time and he would be far too exhausted to drive to the next town. Marie could, though, assuming that there even is a town. Of course there's a town, he muttered. Ready? She asked. Sorry, this fucking heat. (sighs) Remember, when I pound on the hood, throw her in reverse. I was paying attention. Amazing the patience you learned after seven years of marriage. They'd been together two years before that, but patience had never really been a part of their relationship. They'd been too busy with school and sex. There had been love, of that he had no doubt. But love had complicated things. The first year of marriage hadn't been much different. They'd lived together before tying the knot, so they became accustomed to each other's bad habits. Even when the baby came, things had been going strong. When had it gone downhill? After the move? Clarkview wasn't the city. They had agreed the city wasn't the place to raise Chelsea. That was one of the few things they still agreed on. But Clarksville wasn't exactly the suburban life that Marie had in mind. Maybe they would have been happier elsewhere. 
Wick couldn't come up with a specific moment when he realized his marriage was ending. It was as though he'd always known it, which wasn't true at all. As a kid, watching his parents' marriage fizzle, then explode, he'd promised he would never do the same thing. He would marry for life. And he had. He really had. He got his mind trailing, wiped sweat from his forehead, and slammed his palm onto the hood. After he heard the engine accelerate, he pressed his shoulder against the front grille. Marie put the car in reverse and revved the engine. The car moved an inch or two, but quickly settled back into place. Marie leaned out the window. You okay? Yeah. What? Yeah. Just give me a second. You really think you can push this thing up from here? Yeah, I can do it. Rick pounded on the hood and placed both hands against the grill of the car, wincing at the radiating heat. He pushed hard as Marie revved the engine, and the car moved a few inches, enough for him to step forward. He pushed again until his foot slipped in the grass and he fell. Fuck! He yelled as his cheek contacted the hot steel. Rick slid to the ground, grateful he didn't pull anything on his way. He rested against the bumper, breathing heavily. You okay? I'm all right. One more go? He said as he stood and prepared to push once more. It actually took three more tries. Inch by inch, they maneuvered the vehicle into a better position. By the end of it, Rick stripped his shirt off and was covered in sweat and grime. Murray reversed the car the rest of the way from the ditch until the tires finally took hold and the car jerked backwards. As he climbed the small incline, Rick fell again but this time softly into grass and dirt. Rick heard Marie exit the car and call for him again. Between the sun and the exhaustion from pushing, he wanted to lie there. But there was something different in the way she called his name. He sat up, waiting for her to come to his side of the road. What is it? Where's Chelsea? He stood and looked around. She's not with you? Marie's voice became panic-stricken. Why the hell would I ask where she was if she was with me? He watched her march toward the opposite side of the road and look back. He stopped himself from running after her. Running would mean there was a reason to run. Once on the road, he saw Marie a few yards away, pacing back and forth across the highway, looking down the other side. Chelsea? Rick yelled. Chelsea? Marie repeated. Marie turned back to him, wild-eyed. They both took turns calling out Chelsea's name without a response. Finally, Marie snapped. Rick, where is she? Tears streamed down her face. She was here! Rick screamed. She was right fucking here! Chelsea! Come here right this instant! Panic won. Rick ran, rechecking everywhere, his eyes following the path of the hay. Did she get back in the car? Marie asked, hopeful. The car. Yes, she had to be in the car. He hadn't heard her climb back inside, but then he'd been exerting himself, pushing it out of the ditch. He hadn't heard the door open, that's all. Hadn't heard it close, either. He simply hadn't noticed. And neither had Marie. But she'd been caught up in what they were doing, too. They both took off in a run. Marie flung open the passenger door, screaming. Chelsea? Rick watched her lift her hands to her mouth and step back from the car. Oh my god. What? He ripped open the opposing door. She's not here. Rick opened the trunk and dropped to his knees, ignoring the pain that shot up as the hot pavement raised his skin. She wasn't under the car either. Chelsea Elizabeth Palmer, you come here right now! Marie yelled, fists balled to her sides. Chelsea! 
Rick took a deep breath and yelled again. Chelsea! He ran back into the middle of the road. No sign of her. Rick! The tone of her voice changed again. What? He said as he took a step towards her. Look! Rick followed where her fingers pointed, expecting to see Chelsea pop out of the grass, but instead, his eyes rested on a telephone pole with birds perched along the wires. Crows. He counted six. Six crows. God damn it, Marie! Rick lashed out, furious. Rick, that rhyme! He had to slow down before he lost his mind. His gaze shifted from the crows to the grass below. Rick's eyes narrowed as he stepped forward. Behind him, he heard her mumbling something, but he ignored it and moved on a little faster. There was a break in the hay. Small, but still visible. The edge was distorted as if something had broken through. After a moment of staring, he comprehended what he was looking at. A hole in the dried grass. And he saw something else, too. Rick ran, stumbling down the ditch and landing on his knees in front of the hay. Marie was immediately behind him. They both stared, but not at the hole. Rather, what was in it and all around the hole. What's that? She asked, her voice trembling. Rick didn't answer. He continued to stare at what he knew was blood. It's not hers. We're in the country. That blood could belong to anything. Except they were alone out here. And the blood was fresh. They moved towards the small entrance. Marie dropped down to her knees beside him. Rick barely noticed. He stared hard into the hole, noticing how it seemed like someone had been dragged into it. Signs of a struggle. The words resonated in his head for a moment. And then it all clicked. Chelsea's in there. If she's bleeding, she's alive. Rick pushed Marie aside and broke into a run. He parted the tall grass as he took each long, hard step. It was easy to tell where she'd been. The hay grass was trampled, disorderly, unkempt. There was a trail, a path cut through the field, more or less straight on. Worse than anything, he followed a path of blood, left like a trail of breadcrumbs. He didn't see Chelsea anywhere. He thought about going back for some kind of weapon, but he had already wasted enough time. Marie gasped from somewhere behind him. She tried to keep up, but he forged on without waiting. I'll get her, he said, hoping she would have the wits to turn back and flag someone down. This can't be happening. Rick thought clearly enough to know that despite his panic, despite the time he was losing, he needed to move carefully. If he ran too fast, he might lose track of the path. He went on, one long stride in front of the other. Grass brushed at his arms, face, and chest. A grove of trees, a hundred or so yards away, caught his attention. He couldn't tell from that far back, but figured it was where the trail led. That's where she would go, or whoever, whatever, had her wood. It was the only thing out there besides the goddamn highway. Thoughts berated his mind, trying to loop him into a panic. He imagined worst case scenarios, but he fought past it as he cut through the grass, still following the blood trail. He pushed on, the clearing not far. Tears stung his eyes. He stopped for a second to listen. Marie was stumbling through the trail, crying. Flies buzzed around his ears. 
beetles crawled on his shorts and legs. One crow is unlucky. Marie's voice came from behind him. Rick tried to ignore her and started moving a little faster than before. He followed the path, each blade of grass splattered by a painter's brush. Rick wondered how much blood Chelsea had in her. Then he wondered why he would even think such a thing. Two crows. Lucky. He heard her say. She was on his heels now. He sped up, the clearing not much further. He tried not to notice her. He tried hard to ignore her words. Three is hell, she said louder. Between the blood, heat, and Marie losing her mind, panic won. Four is wealth, her ragged voice screamed. Running was illogical. He needed to slow down. He needed to think. He needed to conserve his strength. But logic was a thing of the past. Logic did not belong beneath a sun that knew neither joy nor pity. Logic belonged in the air-conditioned safety of the Toyota, while his daughter tried in vain to ignore her parents' bickering. Logic belonged back on the East Coast, in a house that was coming apart at the seams. The field opened to a grove of trees, an oasis in the patchwork. Rick stumbled into it and Marie collapsed on the ground beside him, half in and half out of the grassy hill. Five is sickness, she managed to say. Marie regained her feet. Her breath was sharp and jagged. Rick saw she was staring towards the trees and followed her gaze to the center of the grove. Her gasps grew shriller until they petered out into half sobs. If it weren't for Marie, he wouldn't have seen the animal staring at them. It stood several yards away, beside a cluster of small trees grown thick together, its body tense, ready to attack. Rick didn't know if it was a jackal, wolf, or coyote, but he understood why his wife was hyperventilating. He knew as soon as he saw the canine. Blood coated its muzzle. Rick yelled. It was instinctive, primal. No conscious thought, just a buildup of air and a compression of the lungs. It must have been menacing enough, because the beast, a coyote, yes, it had to be a coyote, darted off in the opposite direction. The animal didn't make a sound as it dodged trees and exposed roots its tan body disappearing like a shadow in the dark. Rick and Marie stood still, staring at where the coyote vanished. Images of the dog snatching his daughter from the road flashed through his mind. He took a step, knowing a pack of coyotes might be watching him from the shadows. Then he took another, and another each one cautious, each one forced by whatever willpower remained in his body. When Marie spoke again, he wanted to turn around and strangle her, to tell her she was a lying bitch, but all he could do was let the immensity of her words sink into his flesh like an anchor. Sick is, is death. Rick reached the spot where the coyote had been. He turned so he could see behind the trees and stared down. Then he crouched carefully and reached out a hand, but quickly brought it back to his side. He stared until tears blurred his vision. He looked away, blinking at a tree a few yards to his right. There, in the top few branches, were a bunch of crows all of them seeming to stare at him with black, accusing eyes. Rick couldn't help it. He didn't want to. But what he wanted didn't matter anymore. It hadn't mattered since the car had swerved off the highway into the fields that were now his prison. He counted the crows and began to scream.